Hello once again, everybody. Welcome to Soccer's Overtime, your weekly look inside the San Diego Soccer's and the Major Arena Soccer League. Coming to you live once again on our at San Diego Soccer's channel on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash San Diego Soccer's. Craig Elston, Jerry Jimenez, back with you. It is season four, episode 12. It's episode 101 all time of our little podcast here soccer's overtime and jerry calling this one a golden weekend in chihuahua they didn't get all six points but the soccer's pulled two wins south of the border good evening to you my friend hey it's good to be back oh my gosh it's been such a crazy weekend uh we have so much to talk about and yeah i think that's the perfect title for this one a golden weekend in chihuahua what a goal Two golden goals. I mean, it, maybe, you know, try to find the positive in it. They're a very tough team. I think we, we'll talk about, you know, why we saw what we saw and maybe not expected by a lot of people to get to this point. But my goodness, what just fantastic two games, crazy games, crazy games. We got a ton planned for you here over the next 90 minutes or so on Soccer's Overtime. Again, just a quick reminder, if you're listening to us on the podcast, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's so great to have you along with us for the ride. We are a live show, too. You can now watch us as well as listening to us every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Go to Twitch. Download the Twitch app on your phone or on your pad. You can go to twitch.tv on a laptop slash San Diego Soccers. And just set a reminder to join us live uh, at 5 every Tuesday. We'll be mixing in some viewer comments and questions uh, into the show as we go on. Jerry and I momentarily will recap two wild wins in Chihuahua. Coming up at the bottom of the hour at 5.30, we'll be joined live by our special soccer's player guest for the week, midfielder Felipe Gonzalez. He's been playing some in the back. He might be in the midfield uh, as soon as tomorrow in Ontario. Uh, we will talk to Felipe about an interesting season so far. We'll get to our soccer's news when the interview's over, including the dramatic reveal of our soccer's Star Wars night uh, jersey design. You'll get to see that for the first time to everyone who is here watching with us on Twitch. If you're listening to the podcast, well, you'll just have to take our words eye view uh, or what we described to you. And we'll wrap up with some MASL news. We'll check the standings. The race to 400 is over. Soon the race to 600 is going to be over. We'll talk about all of that coming up. And again, a special hi to everybody uh, that was is with us in the feed and was with us, Jerry. Let's start there. Friday and Saturday night when you and I were at the Califino Sublimit Lounge. We were on the English rebroadcast of those two games uh, from Mexico. First time ever that the MASL was doing simultaneous English and Spanish language broadcasts. And, you know, already just want to say thanks to all the people with the, with the kind words, everyone who hung with us. I know we had a little bit of a hiccup uh, at the start of Saturday's broadcast, but you know what? We figured it all out, man. We got it done. You know, these sorts of things happen, especially when you're going live, when you think that you have it all figured out, you're excited, you're ready to go. And then boom, you forget one thing or, you didn't account for that or, you know, but we got through it and we do appreciate you getting through it with us uh, and being patient. We very much appreciate all of you that were with us on uh, over this weekend. I had a blast, Craig. It was the first time I've ever done anything like it. Uh, and I don't know. It was something I hope to do again. Absolutely. Uh, I think this season, you know, we took advantage of the fact that we were out in Mexico. We had a little bit of, of uh, a weekend over in Mexico, two games. So we said, hey, let's go ahead and try this out. We'll be better prepared for the next one. I don't think we play any more games in Mexico. So maybe, unless maybe the playoffs. Hey, maybe playoffs. the playoffs. Playoffs. Okay, so maybe playoffs. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> uh, but no, thank you again to everybody that hung out with us. And I do see the comments coming up there. Uh, yeah, it's, I did stick with it. <laughs> Craig actually said, I, I think I was about to lose my mind. And Craig said, it's fine. It's fine. We'll be all right. I got this for now. Well, I'm used to radio and that's what it was for a little while. <laughs> All you got was <laughs> radio. Uh, but, and, and then one of these too, but you won't see it yeah. too much today, <laughs> but yeah. I thought that was our new Jersey. I was like, wow, new kit reveal. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> this is gonna be my my kit right here. This is what I'm gonna wear. Technicolor dream coat night at Pachanga <laughs> Arena, San Diego. But no, we're fine. I just you know, we made it work. So I appreciate everybody for sure. Well, let's talk about the matches because they speaking of a baptism of fire, Jerry. Never mind that we were doing new technology, different platform in a tequila lounge, announcing off a video wall something that's <laughs> happening in northern Mexico and turning it into a broadcast uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, on top of all of that, we were gifted with two absolutely wild matches of indoor soccer and we start to bring you the highlights if you're watching our live stream here uh courtesy of our good mate eddie trujillo who puts together the highlight packages uh each and every week jerry and you know friday saturday back-to-back -back games i thought the friday performance was a very complete performance for the soccers i thought there was a lot of adversity to that game uh, that we can get in to and we can detail but you know i think you really just have to start with Poyo power i mean we had the chicken power going in game one of the two game set in chihuahua iran Poyo ruiz unable to play north of the border p1 visa restriction situation able to play in his home country of mexico and my goodness jerry did Poyo come to play this weekend Oh my goodness. Uh, boy, do we miss him playing over here in the United States. But yeah, I mean, I think you said it, the, the chickens loose in Chihuahua. Uh, what a fantastic game. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he is now uh, highest points average per game because of those two games for the San Diego Soccers. What an amazing performance. Uh, we've come to expect that, I think, from Iran Pollo Ruiz. But my goodness, like there you're seeing a goal now. If you are uh, joining us live right now, bringing the uh, San Diego Soccers to 4-2 against Chihuahua. But man, what can you not say about this man? This man is very sorely missed for sure. And hopefully Visa things get you know figured out soon because imagine that against Ontario. Like that's what I want to see. If we added uh, Pollo to, to our squad against not just, I shouldn't just say Ontario, against everybody. We'd be running circles around these guys um, even more so. It's just an additional weapon that I think we're very much missing. But it was great to see him, of course, this weekend. I think everybody um, enjoyed seeing Pollo play. As a matter of fact, Jerry, uh, Pollo won MASL Offensive Player of the Week. That was announced uh, earlier this afternoon by the Major Arena Soccer League. And to be honest, they're still shorting him. I, I turned it in Monday uh, to the league, the two clips. They shorted him two assists down in Chihuahua on Saturday. He should have had five assists. He was credited with three. Uh, one of those two uncredited assists are is absolutely undisputable. Uh, when he passed to Christian Gutierrez, uh, the other one deflected off of a Chihuahua player. And I guess if you really wanted to be a grumpy statistician, you could try and make an argument against the assist there. But I just saw Frank Tayu get an assist uh, last week for shot, save, rebound, goal. And they gave him an assist for the shot. So Poyo should have two more assists for a 9.3 block weekend in chihuahua in two games it was almost like he took a season's worth of production and just jammed it into his two games for san diego a hundred percent and you know as you're talking about that i would say that that is one of the things that i've noticed um and it could go either way right not necessarily against the suckers but i feel like um there needs to be a little better consistency across the board with these types of calls um uh, these types of uh you know, things coming out of games in order to make it a little bit more enjoyable. I feel like that it does take away a little bit uh, when it comes to these numbers and, you know, sometimes crazy numbers coming through. Uh, that's what I would ask of, you know, all officials or anybody taking numbers, just a little bit more consistency. And I think in, in this situation, I mean, if he's getting, that's two points, that's quite a bit, especially <laughs> when he's only playing two games with us. But um, so are you saying that we recognize him as, soccer's but the league hasn't quite adjusted that yet i'm sure they will yeah well you know i'll just say this is something that happens every week for just about every game indoor soccer is a hard game to score 
And as this league works to improve, you know, it's really the scorekeepers that that you're talking about. And those are people that aren't referees. They're people who have been hired, you know, okay. by the team to sit down and input, you know, the, the statistics into the computer in real time. And, you know, there are some cities that are better at it than others, just to be perfectly honest. There are some cities in the MASL that have not done a good job with particular stats, have not done a good job with assists, have not done a good job with blocked shots. And when you're new to it, things will change. For example, in Chihuahua, they were listing last weekend, like literally any time someone kicked the ball in the offensive zone, they were calling it a shot. Uh, they gave Chihuahua like 60 shots in the game. And, and obviously that's not the case, you know, so I, I give them credit and, and truly every week we go through, we rewatch the highlights. Players will send me texts, Jerry. Hey, you know, look back at goal five. I got an assist on that. They didn't give me credit for it, you know, or, Hey, uh, there were a dozen saves, not five saves, you know, stuff like that. Over the years, I've gotten texts like that over and over. And then you go through and you and you look for it and you look to find it. And especially a new place, first time, first two games, first two games being scored, really not a surprise that a couple of things were missed. Um, yeah. We're literally doing a forensic accounting, for example, of the two games to find shots and save totals for Boris Pardo because they gave him like five saves in the first game. And I mean, he had like five saves in a sequence <laughs> in that game. Five, at, at five, saves, five saves, 50 something shots. That makes perfect sense. Oh, right. Yeah, God. exactly. So, so, you know, look, those little things get cleaned up, but I'll say one thing right off the top, like, you and I were going back and forth and I was showing you the pictures that were coming to us from Chihuahua during the day on Friday. And yeah. I want to give the Savage organization truly a lot of credit because that field came together <laughs> on Friday. I mean, quite literally came together at like two 30 before the seven o'clock game. It didn't look like a field. And then at 4.30, it maybe looked like half of a field or a third of a field. And I think you and I were really, really wondering, like, is this game going to go on? Is it going to be delayed? Are there going to be issues? Is the turf going to come up? Is, you know, is everything going to? And from what I was, uh, from what I heard talking to our athletic trainer and our team MVP, Paul Savage, Jerry, they had like literally like a hundred people working on the field at the same time. And by the time warm-ups came, uh, a little bit after six o'clock, they had themselves a field. They had themselves a lovely arena. It was really well decorated. And they wound up with, I thought, a pretty bang up uh, video presentation uh, of the match as well. So, I, hey, it came together late, but kudos to Chihuahua. It came together. Yeah, that was scary right at the, near the beginning of the game, but you know, I feel like they they did such a fantastic job, and we couldn't stop praising them on the on the broadcast because you could see it. I mean, you can see it here. It just looks great. It looks like such a cool place to to play and to uh, to go and watch a game of indoor. It just looks uh, really cool, and that came together very quickly uh, at a very surprising rate. I wouldn't be surprised if they said. With your ticket, you also get the opportunity to help us build the stadium. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> and then a hundred hands came in, <laughs> you know, and that's how it worked out. Uh, and yeah, I, hey, leave it to Mexican people to be able to build something this beautiful this quickly. Uh, that was that was awesome. No, I was really proud to see that honestly. And it was just, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to play. Uh, I can't wait. We said it multiple times. I can't wait to be able to go and actually see a game at this arena in person. We'll be there. We'll be there eventually, Jerry. Who knows when we'll be there next because uh, we'll talk about it uh, later in the podcast. But I think Chihuahua is absolutely going to make the playoffs. I believe Chihuahua will make the playoffs. Uh, you know, eight out of 12 clubs in this league make the playoffs. And I firmly believe Chihuahua is one of the eight best teams uh, in this league. I think in Mexico, they're probably one of the four best teams in this league. Uh, and to get two wins out of that environment with the passion and the style that Chihuahua played and all the additional talent 
that they had on the floor for those two games that they have not had stateside and no ability to really recognize those, you know, those players to, to there's no film on it. You don't know how they're going to all play together uh, for, for San Diego to come out of there two and oh, admittedly two overtime wins, no regulation wins, but to come out two and oh, I'm, I'm really curious if another team this year in the MASL that goes down there for the back-to-back is going to come out with two victories. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, we've talked about, about the visa issues that have been kind of plaguing the league just in general. In this situation, we got to see a full strength uh, Chihuahua, I would say, at least for the first game. I know there was a couple of injuries from there that um, kind of carried on to the second game. But I would say the first, I mean, you tell me if you agree or not, but I would say the first game was the more of the full strength. However, <laughs> they definitely showed up for the second one. So it's kind of kind of a tough one to say. Regardless, Chihuahua looked fantastic. Also, I think in addition to that is you saw the endurance of these athletes out there for the last two games. Playing two games back-to-back is no oh. joke. And Not in this sport. Not on that surface. Oh, my God. Not on that mini field. <laughs> like That was tiny, too. That's another thing that we talked about quite a bit is I think you called it right, called it right away. You said, this does seem like a very short, small field. And come to find out, it, it actually really, truly was a really small field. Yeah, it's about 45 feet shorter in length than the soccer field at Pechanga Arena San Diego. Uh, from wow. 210 feet lengthwise to 165. Uh, and, and it wasn't as wide uh, as the Pechanga Arena field. There's about 10 yards less wide. so Or 10 feet, pardon me, less wide. So it's such a challenge to play this style of indoor football. And if you want to call it football rapido, I mean, <laughs> football demasiado rapido almost. <laughs> it, it, it's it's wild because there's no midfield. It's just defense to offense, offense to defense, defense to offense, offense to defense. And what we really saw in the two matches, Jerry, because the style of the setup of this floor was that they had corner glass, but they really didn't have glass along the sides of the field is you had a lot of blocked shots out of play, a lot of balls that leave the field of play, a lot of restarts, a lot of set pieces, and a lot of goalie throws. And I mean, those keepers must have had sore shoulders. They must have iced their shoulders like starting pitchers at the end of those matches because they must have had 40 throws each. Oh, easy. Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, I mean maybe when we start talking about the second game, we can talk about what Boris Porto did. But... <laughs> You know, it's yeah, I can't imagine them not being sore after that first game. And then the, the both goalkeepers have to go in and play another game within 24 hours. Crazy. It, completely wild. So Friday, of course, 6-5 overtime win. Chihuahua gets three straight goals in the third and fourth quarter. They take the lead. The Soccers are trailing. They have to pull Pardo. They have to bring in the sixth attacker. Uh, they used Poyo as the sixth attacker. And they scored in 12 seconds, Jerry. The Sockers are two for two now on sixth attacker, tying games late, once at home against Ontario and now once uh, at Chihuahua. And you don't want to do it a lot, but to be two for two, that's pretty awesome. No, absolutely. And I think that's, uh, you know, the power of the Sockers right now, honestly, is that we have been given opportunities and when it comes to that sort of thing, advantages like the, you know, having a six attacker out or uh, the power plays, we've been able to convert and then also defend on power plays really well. Um, and this has really showed up to benefit the soccer's and add um, to, to our leads, honestly. So He zapped out on me for just a second there, but I think I got the gist of what you were saying. Now, uh, we met, we've got Felipe Gonzalez coming up in about 10 minutes, folks, if you're listening. So stay right there uh, as Felipe will be joining us. If you're on the podcast, why am I offering a live stay tuned? I mean, right. I know it's a little different doing a live show. I get into all the radio habits of a reset and a hey, stay <laughs> tuned. But uh, Felipe Gonzalez coming up in just a few minutes. Let's get into at least a little bit of the Saturday match. Uh, I really thought. 
Friday's match was like underrated in terms of how solid a defensive performance that was for San Diego. I thought Pardo was terrific. It's Im almost impossible to hold a team to five goals on, on a tiny field like that. And Chihuahua was so much offensive talent, so much talent in the attack to hold them to five goals, I thought was terrific. But you get to that Saturday game. And just like you said, it's back to back. It's even an hour earlier. So it's two games in 23 hours. And I think that's where you really see a little bit more tired legs, keepers who are a little bit stiffer, you know, have a little bit harder time. And boom, what do you have? You have an offensive explosion. You have 21 goals uh, in, in a match that was what a what like an NBA game is what it was like. It was just back and forth and forth and back. And the Sockers with a really strong start and Chihuahua with another great second half push. San Diego didn't have to go six attackers this time, Jerry. Instead, it was Brandon Escoto in lights, hero of the game, 28th birthday, scores on the power play, 16 seconds left. Soccer's lead 10 to nine. I've got the game story being written in my head, you know, as, as we are, as we're talking and, and only 16 seconds left. And I do think there was some significant controversy in the 15 seconds that preceded the final free kick. And then a free kick that was really well executed and, and you know, not very well defended by San Diego. Uh, that leads to a goal literally as time expires with, with no time on the clock. Uh, it, it's 10 to 10. It was so confusing. Uh, it was, you know, it's difficult to pinpoint uh, the feelings because you felt like you had it, you know, and we were singing, we were singing Mañanitas already to, uh, <laughs> to Escoto. These are the Mañanitas in the background in case you can hear this. Uh, and we're all celebrating with Vicente Fernandez playing in the background, you know, and what happened? <laughs> what happened? Like two oh seconds. I think I saw comments of people saying, wait, they started back up, but the clock hasn't started back up. What is going on? There was all this confusion. And I think that confusion led to the soccer's not defending properly. You, you said it, Craig. It was very well executed kick. I mean, they score it, bring it up, tie it up. And here we go again over time. Right. You know, there were two calls in there that that had even this morning at training soccer's assistant coach, Renee Ortiz, really pissed off. And <laughs> yet, yes, like really pissed off. And mm. you can go to the foul that's called with two seconds on Boris Pardo, where the Chihuahua player feels a touch on his back and goes flying and actually knocks over a soccer's defender. And a whistle is, is sounded and they get a free kick. But about eight seconds before that, Mitchell Cardenas was just controlling the ball in the corner and official Fernando Pena blew the whistle dead and called a jump, like a drop ball, a 50, 50 ball. And Cardenas was in possession. He was, he was standing on the ball and, and they whistled that. And that, that was weird. And that's how Chihuahua got the ball back to get the foul uh, that led to the free kick. So, Look, there's always controversy in indoor. There's always a call that could have gone this way or that. No point to get like deep into the weeds and go. Oh, blah, 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 blah. But this yeah. was a really challenging weekend. That's my point. It's a really challenging weekend for the soccer's and teams in the MASL always know that when they go to Mexico, it's it's going to be hard. The crowd's right on top of you. Things get intense. Teams are very passionate, and quite often unwittingly you might be on the wrong side of a couple of calls when you're down there. And it's just part and parcel with the challenge of being in Mexico and trying to pull a win out. So did you get not just one, but two, when each one of these games came right down to the wire, that's where you have to give the soccer so much credit, Jerry. And then, you know, we, we say overtime, right? 18 seconds into overtime, another ball out of play, you know, another shot saved over the wall a corner kick and the soccer set pieces in Chihuahua were so, so good and so important as really it's the difference. in then winning both games is be able, being able to convert either corners or top of the arc chances into goals. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Our set pieces were fantastic. I think the guys very much showed up. And even though we had all these things, these odd, weird calls that maybe in the moment didn't make sense to the players, they still held their own and they had to because we're going into overtime now and these guys wanted to win it. And they, you know, they hung in there um, a couple of missteps. And unfortunately, you know, that is the way that life goes sometimes. Uh, and, and I don't want to say that this was like done on purpose. I think it's just heat of the moment. And then also, I do believe that there was it was a accumulation of a lot of different things. For example, the field, the mini field is also probably tougher for the refs. They were their brains must have been going you know, 100 miles per hour, just like the players yes. were going 100 miles per hour. And so that adds to it. Um, and so you can't pinpoint or you can't point fingers um, at, as as easily, I would say, in, in situations like this one. But we were able to, again, still really take advantage of our opportunities and our set pieces, something that we weren't all that great, to be honest, at the beginning of last season. And yes. I think this season we have very much cleaned it up in such a way that it is... It's beautiful to see, if I'm being honest. And we once again are find ourselves in an over in an uh, overtime situation, but we make it work and we again take the win. You know, and when I see it in the comments, it, it's true. It, one of the things that happened on Saturday is that Mitchell Cardenas was shown a blue card for four fouls in the first half, and it was three. He, he he didn't commit four fouls. He committed three. And I remember you and I seeing him pleading and <laughs> begging in well, the penalty well, box. Count, count. <laughs> you know, like, count how many fouls? Because it's not four. He kept telling them, and they were like, go sit down. You're not and what a difference it makes, too, right? Because no Guerrero Pino. So Mitchell was the number one defender for San Diego and he had to play the whole second half knowing that he had basically one foul yeah. for the half, because if he has two, then he's out of there. You know, he's, he's red carded and uh, you can't really appeal a blue card. I mean, in, in the postseason, you could throw a flag. Uh, here's the funny thing though, because uh, from uh, miss what's it four one, one who uh, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice line, John uh, in the official stats, at halftime, Mitchell was listed as having three fouls. So, like, it was wrong on its face. It was it was wrong in the official numbers. He ended the game with three fouls. <laughs> and he was called for a four fouls blue card. So, you know, look, it is what it is. The Soccers won the match. They pulled it out. And here, as we wait for Felipe Gonzalez to, to, to sign in, here's why I talk about Tavoy Morgan. Because... What a justice right there. Right. I mean, the soccers have this force at forward that is relentless to scoring, you know, and, and relentless in terms of being in the right place and finishing and, and has two hat tricks in the last three games on this road trip, you know, finishes a hat trick to finish a win, uh, you know, in, uh, in Chihuahua on Saturday now has 12 goals is it amongst the league leaders. And especially in terms of goals per game uh, at, at eight, it does look good on you. Yikes. Thank you. Uh, to me, Tavoy is just such a difference maker on this team. What's happening at forward. We could even talk about it more generally, but what's happening at forward right now with Christian Gutierrez four game goal scoring streak to Voy Morgan, two hat tricks in the last three games and Craig Childs accepting a slightly reduced role and becoming more effective as a result and just pouring in the points on set pieces and, and really, you know, engineering the special teams that, that the soccer's have had so much, so much success with so far this season. So it's really exciting to see that part of the club come together this way. No, hundred percent. And back to Tavoy, I would say, you know, it felt like it felt like justice was served. They were able to completely shut down Tavoy the first game, and I think he came in the second one, and you know, in overtime, scores the winning uh, goal, the golden goal. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think there's much more to add. I think you're, you know, you hit it perfectly, Tavoy uh, up there, Christian Gutierrez bringing it. We thought we talked about this being an important thing this year where he had to bring that momentum from the last season. He has Craig Childs adapting to that. And all, and you're saying that now every single game he has had points and he's been in the right place at the right time. 
even though he we, he doesn't see as much action it feels like he also very much is creating so much for the team um and i think everybody's finding the right seat on the bus you know everybody is uh, has found their seat comfortably they called th th that's my seat and they all just have very perfectly fit and now we're moving forward as a unit and it feels awesome you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Jerry. In fact, I was talking to our GM, Sean Bowers, about that at training this morning, like this exact topic. How it just feels like a lot of the pieces of this team fit together in a way that even some other clubs haven't in the past in soccer's history. And, and I just give so much credit to Craig Childs because, you know, the Craig Childs of four or five years ago or even maybe three years ago, you know, is taking up the same usage rate as he was as a young player, but not at the exact same productivity level that he was at as a young player. And I've heard it. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, the game in Ontario last week where I heard Craig coming to the bench as the game was about to start saying to Christian Gutierrez, listen, I'm going to focus on set pieces. I'm going to focus on the power play. You're going to take more of my shifts. And he's making calls on the bench when it's his turn to come on and go, no, wait, the situation's better for Christian. Christian, you get out there. No, wait, to avoid this situation's better for you. You get out there. I'll take my spot when my spot comes. And for a guy who's the all-time leading scorer in the franchise, a future retired number, a future indoor soccer hall of famer, the captain of the team, a five-time champion, but 37 years old, to now start to kind of find that spot. Where am I? Where do I fit? How does it work? And am I transitioning slightly toward maybe a coaching future, you know, of, of, of knowing my spot on the team? Almost undoubtedly so. But I just think Craig deserves so much credit for that because there are plenty of egos that sink teams by not recognizing really where they are having that awareness of where they are in their career. And it's not that Craig is fading. He had three points last game. He had four points of the, over the weekend. He's averaging two points a game. You know, he's doing great, but he's doing more with less. He's like that. I'll give you an example. He's like Kevin Love uh, on the Cleveland Cavaliers, who used to be an all-star player, play 40 minutes, score 25 points a game. And now he's coming off their bench. He's, he's playing 20 minutes and he's scoring 15 points a game. You know, his, his efficiency is higher than ever, even though he's playing fewer minutes because he's finding his spot and he knows uh, knows what he needs to do uh, to be successful. I think a captain sets a tone on stuff like this. It can be a selfish tone or it can be a selfless tone. And I think Craig Child's selfless tone is a huge part of why this team's chemistry is so strong right now. Yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent agree. Uh, you threw that out there and, uh, you know, I could totally see that too. him in the future in a coaching position. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I think he has the, uh, <laughs> very much has, uh, the leadership skills, uh, and he has shown that for years and years and years. And here's more of that. Here's more of what you've come to expect from our captain, Craig Childs. I, that man is just amazing. All right, it's the bottom of the hour, and it's time to welcome in our special guest. He didn't know if he was going to play at all over the course of this weekend in Mexico, and not only did he play, he had a couple of huge goals in Saturday's 11-10 to 10 win over Chihuahua. He is one of the veteran glue guys on this team. Felipe Gonzalez is our special guest, and we welcome him live on to Soccer's Overtime here on Twitch TV Felipe, Craig, and Jerry, your pals here. Thank you so much for the time this evening, my friend. No, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you uh, for having me here. Well, it's certainly our pleasure. And uh, let, let's let's get into it, man. We just went through in the first half hour of the show. We really recapped the two games uh, down in Chihuahua. Mm -hmm. And tell me from a player's perspective, what was the challenge like in that arena, in that environment, playing those matches down in North Mexico? Uh obviously <laughs> the toughest part i think was um uh, definitely the field you know we're so used to playing on these on these big fields big arenas where where you have a lot of room you know and you can manage a certain strategy um playing on these on these smaller fields you know i feel like strategy sometimes may go out the window a little bit 
and it's just one of those games where you gotta you gotta work hard, dig deep, and and and, and pull through. Basically, you know, it's because it's a lot of back and forth. You know, it's harder to sub because it is a smaller field. Um, so so you're on the field a lot. You know, I think some of our guys got caught on the field four or five minutes just because it was so hard to, to get off the field, especially when you have a long bench. But um, I think we managed well, regardless. Uh, we did well. And then that aspect, we could. And I think the guys, the guys uh, uh, were able to read the game well and then knew when exactly when to sub. And I think things uh, kind of landed our way, I guess you can say. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about is guys um, like yourself, um, like Cesar Cerda, and, and many others in the squad being able to, um, you know, go through and, and play in tough situations. Uh, maybe sometimes, like we said, uh, you know, we weren't sure if you were going to actually come in for this game. Um, if there was a leg tweak there. Um, I'm kind of interested in, in what that was like for you having to kind of get through that for this game. Um, definitely nerve wracking. You know, just because, you know, I've been dealing with a little hamstring issue. Um, I did it, I think, January 2nd. Then I felt good for that week. Did it again January 9th against Ontario, both against Ontario. So that's part of the reason why I didn't play against them away. Um, but it's nerve wracking because you just never know. You know, a hamstring issue, you can feel well. And then at any time, you can just pull it. You know, we had a little issue with Charlie already, unfortunately. Uh, so you just never know when, you, when you're going to get hurt. But, you know, with the, with, with the staff that we have, they've been doing a good job with me, taking care of me. Um, you know, I've been going to therapy every day. So that that for me was was a relief because I, I you know I have I have the people to help me out, but definitely there's always something in the back of your mind where you're scared that you might make it worse than it already is. But in the end, we we want to play. We want to play. Um, we took 16 guys, and I think the last thing I wanted to do um, was just not play and have there be 15 guys. You know. I wanted to try and pull through. I, you know, I didn't play a lot, a lot compared to what I'm used to, but I felt, you know, I got enough shifts in for, for what I was feeling and how I was feeling. Um, well, I know having talked to you at practice uh, that week, Felipe, I think there was a lot of thought of like, well, okay, I'll start the game, but I don't know if I'll be able to finish the game, but cool. I'll, I'll start. I'll give you what I can. So I uh, let me uh, turn this into a question this way. How yeah. much comfort do you get as a veteran player having the experience of knowing that Paul Savage, our athletic trainer, knows what he's doing and that you you can trust him, you can trust his judgment. And when he tells you, okay, you shouldn't play today or, okay, you can go, but go this much, that you you can trust his judgment, essentially. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I believe it or not, I've been working with Paul since even before I joined San Diego, you know. Uh, when I was playing for the U.S. and our team, you know, he was – he was the guy taking care of us. He was our trainer there. So, you know, I've been working with Paul one now, seven years, I can say maybe eight, um, around there. Um, so so he's been around the game long enough to know what you need and don't need and if you should play or, you know, shouldn't play. Um, so I feel real comfortable leaving it up to him uh, or Amory and saying, hey, you're good to go. Hey, you shouldn't play. Or if you're going to play, just let me know how you're feeling. Uh, you know, little things like that, you know, and that's kind of what we did during these two games. We managed it. We managed the amount of playing time I had. And so that for me was was crucial. It was really, real, really important. Um, but at the same time, you know, you got to be able to read your body. You only, you know, only you, only you know your body. So you know how much you can go and how much you can, you know. And, um, yeah, you know, maybe at times I felt like, ah, maybe I should step off. And then other times I felt, ah, I'm okay. I should go a little longer and stick it out. Um, you know, I felt a little, a little something there, just nothing crazy. It was more percussion than anything on uh, Saturday's game. That's why I decided to step off the last, like, 10, 12 minutes of the fourth quarter. That's why you guys didn't see me around anymore. But it was also a thing where I I wanted to stay on a little longer because we did have Gurado step off with the ankle injury. So there was a decision yes. I had to kind of make there. You know, there was a decision I had to, I had to make there. And um, it was a tough one at the end of the day, but I, I had to make sure that that I'm okay first and that I'm ready for the for the rest of the season. And, you know, obviously playoffs is what we're aiming for. And I, yeah, I don't want to come into playoffs, you know, feeling hurt or at 80 or 70%. I want to be at 100. 
Yeah, no, and that's uh, one of the things that we've talked about, obviously, is how smart the team as a whole is being, not just with taking care of injuries and obviously saying, hey, you know what, I, I feel good enough or no, you're, you're not good enough uh, here to play. Let's let's take it easy um, and making sure that we're going to be healthy for the long run because it's this is a long game, a longer season that we want to make sure that everybody obviously is healthy for. Along with that, getting details right has been very, very important for the team. Uh, we talked about it earlier this uh, in the podcast and also during the two broadcasts over the weekend. We talked about how important you know, uh, it has been to improve not only the power plays, the penalties, set pieces, that sort of thing. Um, can you tell us, can, you know, some of the adjustments that you guys have made and um, how you guys internally feel about um, about that this season? Um, you know what? I think as the practices go on, you know, as the weeks go by, you know, we're, we're getting better just in making certain decisions. You know, uh, I know at the beginning of the season, it's uh, – a little tough, you know, it can be a little rusty, maybe not up to speed. But, you know, I, I feel like the guys are up to speed right now. You know, they, they run over all these set pieces often. Um, you know, they run them more over and over and over and over again. So I think guys that go on, on, on the field for set pieces, you know, waking, you know, corner kicks or, you know, the three lines or, or the restarts, you know, I have a lot of confidence in them, you know, these guys are all goal scorers, you know. The guys on our on our on our set pieces are all goal scorers, man. So they're there for a reason. But no, I, I feel confident um, in what we're doing. But like I said, it's just a lot of repetition and, and then making sure that that we get it down, we get it down, and then make sure make sure that things go well. And if they don't go well, you know, we we adapt, we adapt, and and that's crucial. We got to learn how to adapt and how to correct our mistakes on the goal because it's a quick game, especially on a small field, makes it a little tougher. So I think the guys were, were definitely able to do that. We're talking with Felipe Gonzalez. And of course the soccers have had Felipe Gonzalez on their team. The soccers have had Juan Gonzalez on their team. <laughs> and then there are the beautiful seasons when the soccers have Felipe and Juan Gonzalez on the team at the same time. How special is it for you to play with your identical twin brother? Uh, it's fun. I enjoy it, you know, um, having them on my side and not on the opposite team is always better because then we get to enjoy the good times and the bad times, you know, at the same time, you know. But I enjoy it, you know, apart from, you know, playing together and whatnot, it's 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 just a lot of fun being on the field at the same time just because we do understand each other. You know, there's none, it's just this little thing we have uh, where we don't have to really yell loud at each other like, what we're expecting each other to do. We just kind of give each other a little look. And I feel like we understand each other to a point where just one little look, all it takes is one little look and I know what he wants and he knows what I want or where I want the ball and little things like that. But it's fun. It's fun. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. It's also fun to play against him, you know, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> rub it in his face if I ever get to beat him and whatnot. But you know, having having to be on the same side is it's it's definitely definitely that much more special. So I, I, I enjoy it. You know, one of the things too that we've uh we've talked quite a bit about is having to face Ontario. You mentioned uh now being heard with Ontario twice uh during both of those games and then now here we go again, we're gonna face Ontario now. What is that the what is it the twentieth time in like five games? <laughs> <laughs> It feels that way. Um, so I, I work on the graphics for match day and I look back and I'm like, wait a minute. I don't think I've ever, I've had to switch the crest very often for the, yeah, yeah, yeah. we keep playing Ontario. <laughs> um, I know. How, how are you guys, how are you guys preparing uh, to face Ontario? How does it feel to have to face them uh, once again so quickly in the beginning of the season? You know what? I mean, don't get me wrong. We'd love to face other teams in the league. You know, you, you want to see new faces. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, in reality, you know, we're, we're you know, I feel like we're, we're top two teams in the league. You know, you know, Terry goes on the road and they play well. They play at home and they can play well, you know. So um, they're a tough team. You know, they've come a long way from where they started. And in Ontario, you know, it's definitely a very, very strong team. You know, they won in the championship last season for no reason. And, you know, they didn't come back from a 5-1 game at our home and beat us 8-7 the time just because, you know, they weren't practicing hard or whatever, you know, they, they're doing a good job, 
you know, all the way from the top to the bottom. But do we want to play on the team soon? Yeah, of course. But it's part of the game. You know, they're on our division. And it's just going to show where, where, we, where we stand at the end of the season. You know, it's good to have these tough matches now so that we're not, you know, going into these playoff games and, and we're not caught flat-footed and say, no, shoot, like, this game is much faster. It's much tougher. This is not something we experienced during the season. You know, absolutely not. At the end of the day, we're here to beat every team and win the championship. And if we have to play on Terry three more times, then so be it. At the end of the day, we got to get through whatever team comes in front of us. Love it. Great, great answer, Felipe. Uh, tremendous stuff. Last thing, and we'll let you go. It's not just playing Ontario tomorrow. The Soccers then play Tacoma at home on Friday, play Utica at home on Sunday. It's three games in five days. And this is a veteran club. Some young legs, certainly. <laughs> uh, but this is a veteran cl club. <laughs> How do you manage? three games in five days without having Paul Savage's entire home turned into a training table. <laughs> uh, it's tough. It's tough. I think it's tough to do that. Um, you know, it's, having two games alone, sometimes is tough enough. Not having three is that much harder. Um, and, and it comes down at the end of the day, it's just, you know, you being responsible and, and taking it upon yourself to, even if you don't feel anything, you know, going to the gym, get a light stretch, recover well, so that the next day we're not feeling any tightness, we're not feeling sore. You know, get rid of all those bad toxins, so that the next day we're 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 feeling light and, and not so stiff and whatnot. But I, I think, you know, like you said, we we are more of a veteran club now. You know, I mean, I got here now was what 25 maybe. You know, it's different now. I'm 32, so we got to take care of our bodies a little more. Um, you know, these next, what, five days, whatever it may be, uh, are, are, are going to test us a little bit, you know, because we do have a few road trips that are going to test us where we play on the East Coast, and then we got to play, and then we got to travel again the next day, and then play, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. But um, uh, these guys, these guys are ready. These guys are ready. Um, we're we're going to make sure, like I said, maintain our bodies, be safe. Um, read our bodies most importantly you know try not to overdo it but we're good we're good we're ready we're fit um, and I think this weekend is going to be exciting you know we get to play two games at home I know uh, Friday is uh, Star Wars uh, Star Wars night so that should be that should be fun too well, Felipe, we can't thank you enough for the time. And we especially thank you for not just having Juan step in and do the interview for you. Uh, <laughs> That's because, been easy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we, we would have definitely, you know, it would have at least taken half the interview for me to figure it out. If not the entire time, you would have probably gotten away with it. Uh, rest well today. We will see you tomorrow in Ontario. And, and thank you so much for, for the time this evening. Absolutely, Craig. Absolutely, Jerry. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Thank you guys for having me. See you, man. Felipe Gonzalez, man, one of the class acts in this league, on this club. Absolutely one of my favorite guys to talk to. One of the smartest guys about this sport who just yeah. understands the ins and outs of this league, Jerry. And I tell you, every time I talk to Felipe, he's just such an engaged mind. He understands. He asks smart questions. He, he's He'll be a great coach if he wants to be at some point in the future. I'm not putting that on him. But <laughs> but if he wants to pick it up, he absolutely could down the road. No, a hundred percent. And you know, we were talking about the um the uh the twins and uh being able to like replace them. Well, I've looked at both of their faces now so long on my computer screen when I'm doing the designs and photoshops and this and that. I think I have it where I can figure it out. I'm gonna I don't know if I wanna try it yet, or I'm gonna go up to one of them and tell them the right name. We'll see how it goes. I'll let you know. <laughs> but I think I <laughs> figured out there's a couple little things in the face area that are that are slightly different. But no, both of them, it's been awesome. And he was talking about, you know, playing with his brother um, and, and being able to play off of each other. And sometimes they just look at each other and they know exactly what one needs or wants. We've seen that a couple of times already this season, Craig. Yes. Uh, yeah, we saw we saw one out of the back of his head, eyes in the back of his head fighting Felipe. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there, there you have it. So it's an, a, a totally an advantage uh, that we have uh, to have both of them. And, you know, especially Felipe, of course. Um, yeah. Love to have him. Thanks. Thanks again, Felipe, for coming on, man.
Felipe, much, much appreciated, my friend. We appreciate you. Uh, we'll send you into the night. And now uh, let's let's transition to soccer's news. We've got soccer's news. We got MASL news. We got game previews. We got a lot to get to. We got about thirty five minutes left in the show. Uh, so let's get going. And you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but the soccer's right now are tied for the league lead in power play, eight for twelve. They are at 83% penalty kill. I think there's one team, Tacoma, that's slightly higher. So you're you're almost 1-1 in power play and penalty kill. And you're absolutely, yeah. while they don't keep this as an official stat in the league, you are absolutely leading the league in set-piece goals. And, you know, you, you alluded to it earlier, Jerry, but when you look at the 2019 2020 soccers, they were one of the worst teams in the league on the power play. When you look at the 2021, you know, COVID season, the soccers were terrible on the power play and almost empty on set pieces for most of the regular season. Like set pieces were just like, oh, well, I guess we're going to have another shot blocked. You know, it, it, it was almost discouraging when they got was, to the top of the arc. I think it was at one point we were like, oh gosh, here comes a power play for the soccers. They're probably going to score on us. Right. <laughs> that bad. Yeah. It, it was. It was that bad. So, like, when you look at 6 one and you go, well, what's going right for the Sockers? Why are the Sockers good? I mean, you can always point to Tavoy Morgan. You can always point to Leo. You can always point to Pino or Pardo or Cardenas. You know, you can go down the list of Escoto. How do I even? Yeah, <laughs> Escoto. Poyo when he's in Mexico. You know, like, there's a lot of guys you can talk about. But. They've had those guys before <laughs> and struggled a little bit. Yeah. It's the, the secret sauce here is getting the details right. It's it's hammering the details. That's how you win playoff games. You win playoff games by converting your set pieces and converting your power plays and by taking the other team's power plays and killing them. And we've been doing just that. And it's so refreshing to see in this season – we have sung their praises because it is such a turnaround, such a crazy turnaround to go from what it used to be to where it is now. Now there's a bit, of, there's a bit, there's a lot of confidence going into a power play. There's a lot of confidence going into penalties and, and everything else uh, that you said, set pieces. Now, my goodness, set pieces always feel good. It's like, here, here we go. There you go. Here's another actual opportunity for us to uh, put the ball on the back of the net. And that's how you get points. And that's how you eventually become a legend and get 600 points. That's how you do it. By converting, well, by taking care. Wonderful transition. Of that. <laughs> well, and, and he has. Craig's been doing the job. And now Craig Childs, soccer's captain, all-time soccer's leading scorer, has 597 career points combined between PASL and MASL. And if he does what we have planned, Jerry, if he does what we told him, and he gets two points in a win tomorrow in Ontario. He'll save that 600th point for Friday night at home. Let's do it. We I didn't think it was going to happen, especially with the way that he's been performing. Hey, look, Mr. Childs, if you want to do your three points in Ontario, please do so. Yes, please. Okay. Please. It'd be great if it was at home, but don't let please don't let us stop you from scoring goals and and putting points on the board. Like don't, don't let us stop you. <laughs> yeah. If you get a first quarter hat trick uh, tomorrow, we won't, we won't throw it back. We won't be upset. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it. We'll hang on to it. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what an incredible career for Craig Childs. We, we, I think the, the main thing I wanted to say about Craig, we said before Felipe came on uh, in terms of his selflessness, finding himself kind of finding his spot at this uh, later stage in his career. It's certainly not over. In fact, the way he's playing, I mean, he could probably get a point and a half a game at age 40, you know, being third forward. And, and that's the thing, Jerry. Craig Childs has kind of become the third forward of the Sockers, and he's let Christian Gutierrez become the second forward for the Sockers. And Christian Gutierrez is having the best season of his career right now. You know, four games yeah. in a row with a goal, killing it on defense, absolutely killing it defensively. And then being able to flip, turn it around, transition. He's one of the most dangerous counterattackers in the entire league. It's an absolute two-way player. And it takes the grace 
of someone like Craig to let Christian absorb that role. And then all of a sudden you, you turn and you go, wow, here's a guy that was being used only as a D runner. And now he's one of the most dangerous players in the league. Yeah, man. What, uh, what a great side it is to see, uh, Christian Gutierrez with the ball at his feet. And you can tell that the teams are starting to realize this. Maybe they, they have, but it's getting more and more. Where he's getting more coverage, somehow still manages uh, to perform. Um, but yeah, kudos to, to, obviously, to Christian Gutierrez, but to a man, a myth, the legend, Mr. Craig Charles, for, like you said, allowing that to happen. We've seen other teams, um, you know, in, in Europe, in MLS, in other leagues that have that veteran player that just wants it all for himself. You know, I'm thinking like a Slatan. I'm thinking of, you know, like that type of player that doesn't really, he comes and contributes, but he's also somewhat selfish. And that is not at all what is happening in this situation. And I think that it's not just Craig, but it's other people catching on to what Craig is doing and playing as a team. We've said it, they look like a unit. They look like one solid uh family when they're out on the field they're playing for each other with each other and as 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 the definition of a team you know um there's no one man for himself here uh and you can feel it which is also very different you can actually feel that um and that i think is why also we're so close to that 600 Craig. we're so close so close can't wait to get there a couple other headlines and then we're going to get to the big reveal here uh momentarily of our Star Wars kits live to our viewing audience uh, here on Twitch. A question that I'm sure you've been asked that I've been asked since the weekend is what's next for Iran Poy Ruiz? And there's really no good answer, to be honest, right now uh, for Poyo or for soccer's fans. You know, the, there's another level of appeal process or there's a reapplication process for the visa. But from what I've been told, nothing that would take place between now and the end of the regular season. So in all likelihood, unless the soccers hang on to him for the whole year, he doesn't get paid. And then they play Chihuahua in a playoff series. That one leg, when you went to Chihuahua, he'd be able to play again. That'd be the only other circumstance in which you see another Ruiz game this season. I mean, barring some, you know, some uh, force majeure, you know, something that comes from the outside that changes things. Uh, that's where it's at. So I just want to say what we said again a week ago. I think there's a really good chance that sometime between now and the next couple of weeks, the soccer's do a loan with Chihuahua and they loan Poyo to Chihuahua. And Chihuahua gets that much better at home, which is a place the, the suckers aren't going to play again this year. They've, they've done their time. They've done their service in Chihuahua. The only time they'll play the Savage again is on Sunday, March 6th. And of course the players who are South of the border won't be able to come North of the border. And that includes Boyo uh, if he was on the team. So while it would be really a bummer to see it happen, I think there's actually, I think there's some strategy to that. Jerry, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense tactically. As much as I don't like it, because that means seeing Pollo in another jersey, I think it does make perfect sense. And you want to keep uh, somebody like Iram Ruiz, you know, healthy, plain, and uh, fit and able to continue on. Uh, you know, it, it, that just, again, we're talking about this club being a family and it being about family. And why wouldn't you give an opportunity for a player that has done so much and given so much on the field? Um, you know, for you to why, why not give them that opportunity to continue playing? That's I feel like that's great, and also the, the added advantage, of course, as you mentioned, of hey, now whatever other teams have to go and face Chihuahua, which they're already fantastic. Imagine throwing Pollo, it just it benefits everybody, it benefits us in a way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it makes perfect sense. We'll see what happens, we'll have to kind of you know, keep our ear to the ground and, and we'll let you know here on the podcast if we hear anything for sure. We will. A uh, <laughs> couple quick updates on the injury front. Gerardo Hurado took a pretty nasty sprained ankle on Saturday. Uh, I saw the picture of it. Uh, extremely purple. 
muy uh, morado. Muy morado. Uh, muy morado. Not good. Uh, he was, you know, being looked at. He's he's a ways away from being back on the field. Uh, it it was it was not pretty. Uh, Charlie Gonzalez took the hamstring injury against Ontario on the 16th. He did participate tonight or this morning in what was an extremely light practice. I mean, extremely light. It wasn't hard running. It wasn't a hard go. Charlie will not play this week. I think without question, Charlie will not play this week. But last week we said a month for Charlie. I'm not sure it's a month anymore. I think the MVP, Paul Savage, with the magic fingers, might extract a week or two of value out of Charlie Gonzalez that that he might not have had if he was still in Ontario. He might be back a little bit sooner than expected. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, man, Paul Savage, the man, the bit, the legend. We've already talked to, about a couple of legends in our club, and he's absolutely one of them. No, and that's good to see. Uh, wish he was playing against Ontario, obviously, at home. Uh, tomorrow but hey uh, as long as he gets healthy and it happens faster than we were expecting that's a win as far as i'm concerned all right we've reached the hour mark of the podcast jerry it's time for the big reveal for everybody who's joining us here on our twitch channel friday is star wars night friday is a special night our second ever star wars night first one was back in december of 2019 at which point we had darth vader kits uh, and they were very popular, very well received. It was a great night for everybody. But I remember in December of 2019 asking Lucasfilm, uh, what about Baby Yoda? What about Mando? What about that guy Mando, the Mandalorian? And they were like, nope, embargoed. Can't use him. No chance. No go. But that was 2019. This is 2022. Things have moved on. Things have progressed. And the Sockers on Friday night will come running out of the Big O wearing Mandalorian-themed kits. Jerry, let's show them to the people. Give the people what they want. Hey, look at those. You've got Mando. Now, I'll describe it for our podcast listeners. It's, it's a black-themed kit. You've got Mando on the front. In his full Beskar armor, he's got Baby Yoda in the uh, crook of his left elbow, you know, cinched up on his side. He's carrying Baby Yoda, and in his right hand, Mando's got the dark saber. He's carrying the dark saber from the end of season two. Of course, the MASL logo on the right uh, shoulder, on the left shoulder, uh, is the Star Wars. Uh, bounty logo that they have for their Mandalorian theme. And then on the back, you've got a silhouetted uh, in gray Mandalorian walking with baby Yoda in his uh, floating baby carrier across presumably the deserts of Tatooine. <laughs> that is so awesome. Um, yeah. And the, the patch says uh, bring home the bounty, which is what we want. Want yes. this Friday. We have a bounty on Nick Pereira and Danny Waltman and Michael <laughs> Ramos and Alex Caceres on Friday. <laughs> so those are the kits. Now, here's Extra the deal. credits if you bring them back alive. How about that? Here's the deal. <laughs> Two and really kind of three ways to get this art on your body, to get this Sockers Star Wars kit art on your body. The first way that we really want to emphasize is our Game worn autographed player jersey auction, and this will be taking place on Live Source. Download the Live Source app. We've used Live Source for years. If you're a soccer fan, you should have downloaded the Live Source app by now. Uh, download it, it's super easy, it's super user friendly. Uh, you'll find the soccer, you know, it tells you to put in your region, you'll find the soccer uh, auction right away. And every player on the team, even the keepers, have their own Star Wars jersey that you can bid on. And we will keep those bids alive until the end of the game on Friday, at which point the bids will close and people will have, you know, we'll have those jerseys washed. We'll have them autographed and they'll get out to you by the next game or the next week. Uh, but all of the money from that game worn autographed 
player jersey auction, that benefits the San Diego Food Bank. So the the money you spend there is money that you are donating to San Diego Food Bank. Soccer's take nothing from it. San Diego Food Bank gets the money from our player-worn jersey auction. And we are thrilled to partner with San Diego Food Bank once again to help those in very tough food circumstances in our in our city and in our county. That's huge. Also, also, Jerry, and this is an all-time first, there will be blank replica jerseys available for sale at the merchandise store. So you don't, we want you to bid on the kits. We want you to bid on the game-worn kits. But you could also get a blank kit. You could get your own kit. You could get a kit for yourself, and that'll be on sale for $85 at the Soccer's Merchandise Stand. An absolutely incredible price for a Star Wars brand new, unique design, MASL Soccer's cross-branded jersey, $85. What a steal. Absolute steal uh, at, at the merchandise stand. But wait, there's more. If that's still a little rich for you, we will have replica t-shirts with the same art on the front of the of the t-shirt not on the back but on the front of the t-shirt the same mandalorian picture with baby yoda and the dark saber the same soccer's crest that art will be on a t-shirt which will be on sale for 30 bucks so you can go the the more economical route you can get yourself a replica jersey or you can bid on the game worn jersey the autographed jersey to benefit san diego food bank three different ways to get that art on your body after friday night love it no that's super awesome you know i'm getting one right a t-shirt yes i'm broke <laughs> i'm totally gonna get a jersey too no it's the the design obviously right now with with star wars i think uh not just a jersey but the environment around there too that you have to go and check out because 501 is, is i'm understanding will be there um obviously uh it just everything the the graphics going on on the Jumbotron, the music, everything is going to be Star Wars. So you do not want to miss it. And a great comment uh, by Miss What's It 411 uh, in the comment bay right now, Jerry, here on Twitch, talking about the, the importance of the San Diego Food Bank. And it's so true because the food pantry usage since the pandemic has gone so, so much higher, so much higher than it has before. It's just so much more important than and it's always been important. It's important every single day, but even more so now. So anything you can do to help us out, please consider that. Consider the balance between your personal financial situation and your desire to help the San Diego Food Bank. And take that into mind as you bid on a Craig Childs or a Boris Pardo or or you know whichever your favorite, a Mitchell Cardenas, whoever your favorite player is on the soccer. Oh, yeah. All right. Jersey's gonna be all anything sweaty. else on Star Wars night? Oh, it's a two dollar Bud Light Friday night. Did we mention oh. that? No, we didn't. Yeah, two bucks Bud Lights. Two dollar Bud back. Light Friday night seems like a good deal. It's because it is <laughs> <laughs> because it's one of the best deals around. And speaking of good deals, let's remind our listeners one more time about I think the best soccer's ticket deal we've ever done. Yeah. The double deal. The double, wait, which way do I have to go? There we go. The double deal. Get a ticket, buy a corner loge or loge ticket to Friday night's game, to Star Wars night, where you're only going to have, you could have five beers for 10 bucks, right? It's a great night, a value night. Buy a corner loge, $25, or a loge, $30 seat. We will give you the exact same seat for Sunday's game against Utica City FC. Because we've talked a lot about Friday's game, Jerry, but we haven't talked at all <laughs> about Utica City on Sunday, about the final game of the home uh, of the uh, weekend set, the final game of the five games in 10, 5.05 p.m. on Sunday, first responders night. We really want you to come to both games. So here's what we're doing for you with the soccer's double deal. It starts with we give you a free ticket to Sunday's game. But we know. We know we've done the research. We understand when you're given a ticket, you weigh that against everything. Like, oh, well, you know, there's a football game on. And, you know, my son had to have a, a soccer game this morning and we're supposed to have family dinner. And, you know, I just don't know if I can make that Sunday game. So here's what we're doing. When you get that free ticket to Sunday, you also get a $10 soccer's merchandise stand credit 
a coupon. It's only available. It's only usable on January 30th at the Sunday game. So you buy a ticket to Friday. You get a free ticket to Sunday. And if you use the free ticket, we give you 10 bucks to spend on any individual item at the soccer's merchandise store during the game on Sunday evening. So that's either a $65 value for 25 bucks, Jerry, or it's a $70 value for 30 bucks. I mean, either way you play it, you're talking about one of the best deals in San Diego sports all year long. But wait, there's more, Craig. Check it out. It also happens to be first responders night on Sunday. And there's a giveaway. So you also get a water bottle. Yeah. <laughs> if nothing else, you also walk away with a water bottle <laughs> and you get to come out. You know, we're going to have a police versus fire bubble soccer at halftime on Sundays uh, at Sunday's game. Oh, we're going to be honoring. Fun. Right. We're going to be honoring yes. our first responders. It's going to be an incredible. And it's the first ever meeting between the soccers and Utica City FC. So it's it's everything, you know, Ben Raymond, who was on our team last year, he'll be back uh, with Utica. We'll be honoring him as well for uh, picking up a ring with us last season. So there's so much going on and we're trying to make it literally as easy and as affordable as it could possibly be for you to come out and support the San Diego Soccers this weekend. Yeah, I can't wait to see everybody out. It's going to be a blast, a very busy weekend for us, uh, but we would love to see you over there for sure. All right, let's talk some MASL news now, Jerry. Let's get into it. And hey, the race for 400. <laughs> Over. We held off Frank long enough. He had to go <laughs> ahead and get it in Baltimore. That's fine. He got it in Baltimore. Yeah, he didn't get it with us. That oh, That's good. That's good with me. No, that was uh, an exciting, obviously, uh, an exciting race between Tayu and, and Gibson. Uh, a legend already in his own right. Uh, Leo is is fantastic, and of, of course, Tayo I think still has a lot to to do as well, and a lot to prove and to show. Uh, so I think a legend absolutely in the making. Uh, a lot of people already consider him one, but man, race to four hundred was so close, so close. Yeah. Um, it just came down to basically Tayo destroying teams for a little while there, maybe two games where he had a ton of points and really you know really gained some ground on on Gibson. Well, good job, Leo Gibson. And I, I see S. Barber. I, you know, I feel you. This isn't striking fury. Do we really have to talk about Frank? I mean, look, I just. Uh... <laughs> That's fair. Sorry. By the way, I also just got a text because I mentioned Ben Raymond. Slavisha Ubaparapovic absolutely gets a ring as well. Um, and if he's here, we're honoring him uh, on Sunday as well. So I didn't mention mean to just mention Ben. Of course, Slav was a part of this team. When Milwaukee comes in, you'll see Marcio Leite, you'll see Gordy Gerson, who were you know parts of last year's team, and uh, when Florida comes in, Taylor Bond, you know a part of last year's team. And we'll give all of those guys a moment on the field. We'll give all of those guys, uh, you know, a chance to get their rings, of course. Uh, and we're we're thrilled to have them all come in. So it's it's a huge week. And you know the craziest thing to me, Jerry, is that like I kind of keep forgetting that they're playing Ontario tomorrow. You know, like we're so worked yeah. up for Friday Star Wars night. Like, right. Frank Tyu and Justin Stinson and Berto Palmer and Chris Toth and everybody. They're waiting for us with revenge on their minds tomorrow night, 7 p.m. at uh, Toyota Arena in Ontario. I will be there manning the social media feeds, giving you IG live, you know, pregame and at halftime, bringing you interviews uh, after the match. Hopefully very happy interviews. You know, and filling up your IG story. Make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter uh, at San Diego Soccer's to get all of the the news, all of the views. But uh, with three games in five days, you know, this is the one, Jerry, that you kind of think of like, is this a trap game for San? Is is this in particular a trap game? You just came back from two games in Mexico. You've already played Ontario. You're thinking ahead to the weekend, but Ontario ain't going to be thinking past you. They're going to be thinking only about you. Yeah, now that you bring that up, that did cross my mind the other day. This one definitely does feel like a trap game. Uh, but you know what? I'm really looking forward uh, to it. I think it's going to be a, a good test of where we are. Um, if, you know, the, the 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 good thing for me is I, I feel like good that that happens first, and then we go into the two games uh, against uh, Tacoma and Utica. It, it's exciting. I, like I, I kind of almost skipped over it, like you said, too, because mentally – 
my head, it's like, well, we already faced to home or uh, Ontario, and we've seen Ontario, and we've seen Chihuahua, and it feels like that's the only two teams that we've been playing for a while. Obviously, we opened up the season with Tacoma, but uh, we see them again for you know the, the second time this season, and then Utica, finally a new team that we can actually um, it kind of enjoy at home, other than these teams. But I don't know. It's I, I've, I'm going into it honestly confident. I feel like we have what we need. I think they're in a very good mental place right now. And I do think that Ontario is obviously doing great for themselves. But I do strongly believe that this is going to be uh, a very good game for the soccers. Uh, and I think we're going to show uh, you know, where we are and show our level. It's going to be important for us to show our level. And I hope that it's, uh, it's, it's coming home with uh, three points. The first three games give you a lot of reason to feel confident about a soccer's Ontario matchup, to feel confident about the future of a soccer's Ontario matchup. But I do think uh, that this particular game, their second match at home, they just came off two good games in Baltimore, in Utica. Their confidence has got to be riding pretty high. Uh, as S. Barber noted, they've got one fewer day of rest than the soccers do. They did have a tough travel situation going all the way to the East Coast. We went about half the distance uh, of that to get to Chihuahua. So, you know, there, there's certain things that balance out one way or the other uh, on this. But I just think it's going to be a really good game. And if Ontario wins it, then really these four games were pretty much a wash. And you didn't really learn a lot, you know, it, it's just, Hey, these are two of the best teams in the league. If the soccer's beat Ontario, they will be six points ahead of Ontario with a game in hand facing two essentially last place clubs, you know, this weekend and maybe an opportunity to really build out a little bit of an advantage uh, in the MASL West, maybe make it a little bit less of a race uh, than Ontario would like it to be. So a, a really big game on Wednesday, uh, no question about don't it. Worry. Don't worry. We'll see them again two times after this Wednesday. So we'll get another test. Uh, just a couple other things real quick. Uh, you know, the, the Dallas sidekicks train that was just chugging down the track uh, got derailed by a trip to Florida uh, where they got pretty much smashed back-to-back uh, -back games and Florida racked up huge offensive totals like they have all year long. So, you know, I don't think any of us thought that Dallas was just going to run the table or anything, uh, you know, coming out of the Ricardinho coaching change, but they were playing like it. So I, I did feel like this uh, weekend's results were a bit of a reality check for the sidekicks. Man, Dallas, it was honestly very disappointing. I, I was hoping that they would put up a much bigger fight. I mean, Florida, nothing to take away from them. Obviously they're, you know, doing fantastic things over there and playing great but it just honestly florida made dallas look bad and i was expecting so much more from from dallas uh they will definitely need to have a strong mind uh, to recover and i think that you know most most teams do but in dallas i mean what changes do you make over there it feels like they're a great team it feels like on paper they look they look good they've obviously been able to show up against other teams was it just that florida is that much stronger i mean it's it's hard for me to say craig you you tell me what you think about that i think florida's in a different class than dallas um okay. but but something to keep in mind dallas has played 11 games now and their goal differential is negative 22 that is second worst in the league to harrisburg who is negative 23 with six games played. So, I mean, a uh, significant difference uh, between Harrisburg's minus 23 and Dallas's minus 22. But still, minus 22 in 11 games means you're two goals worse than your opponent on average every game. And, and yes, some of that was Florida, uh, you know, piling it on uh, in a blowout win and, and a couple of early wins that were pretty much blowout wins uh, against Dallas. But, I think this was a needed reality check for a Dallas team that had been surging and winning a lot of very close games uh, that this time they, they take the L. Milwaukee got a win. Let's just look at the standings real quick. In the West, San Diego at 6-0-1 has 17 points with seven games played. Ontario is 5-3, and three, eight games played, 14 points. Tacoma, just six games played. That'll start to tick up here in the next couple weeks. But they are 2-4 and four 
with six points. And then there's Chihuahua, six games played, no wins. Now two overtime losses, just two points in the standings. That's the lowest uh, in the entire league, 12th in terms of the, the point standings, uh, Jerry. But I think it's I think it's really fair to say after watching those two matches, this is going to change. A hundred percent. Yeah, I don't see it not changing. Could it change for Florida too? I think I think a lot of people would agree that yes, uh, because of the fact that they've played so many games at home. Yes. Going on the road is a totally different animal. This we could be seeing a lot of movement in opposite directions for some of these teams. Absolutely. And when you look to the East, Florida has played the most games in the league, uh, second most games in the league, 10. They've played eight of their 10 at home. They've played, I believe, eight in a row at home. They have won seven, and they are now nine and one with a ridiculous plus 49 goal differential, averaging eight and a half goals per game and allowing only 3.6 point, uh, goals per game. Florida has been tremendous so far. And I think it's important to note, Jerry, last year, Florida was the number one seed. Florida was the best team in the MASL and their uh, reward for being the number one team in the MASL was to not play a single game at home to watch at home, actually to watch. From yeah. Home. They, they, they had to go play us in Kansas city on a neutral field. And we beat them twice, once in overtime, once in the last That's minute of the game in, in a neutral game at Kansas city, Florida at home is the best team in the league. Florida on the road is a good team, a, a really good team. And John San Diego 619, you're right. They picked us. They selected us to be their opponent uh, in, in that round. I mean, it was the right call, so to speak, except that we beat them. Uh, so then it was the wrong call, <laughs> you know, because uh, looking back. But somebody uh, from Florida is watching right now going, why you got to bring back those sad times? <laughs> why, why, why you got to talk about the past? Why you got to talk about the past like that? The future now, man. <laughs> but, you know, wh whatever happens, Florida is going to get to play home games in the playoffs this year. So it's a much different situation. And if they keep the number one seed, it's going to be, hey, it doesn't matter what you do against us in the first half of the playoff. You're going to have to come down to the RP Funding Center in Lakeside and you're going to have to beat us. You know, you're going to have to beat us on our field uh, playing the way we play. So uh, really impressive so far. Obviously, Florida, I, I've seen some people with their power rankings put Florida one, soccer's two. And I think that's very fair. I think it's very fair right now. Um, Baltimore, uh, four and four. Not looking good. <laughs> Lost to Ontario at home, went to uh, to Harrisburg and gave Harrisburg their first win of the year. 11 points with eight games played. Really rough start for the Baltimore blast Utica two and seven, uh, just six points, Harrisburg one and five, just three points. The only thing I would note out of that Jerry is that Utica, yes, they are two and seven. Uh, they have been playing better lately and they could have beaten Ontario. They lost that in the last minute, uh, a Berto Palmer last minute goal is how Ontario beat them on Sunday. And then they were in Milwaukee winning with eight seconds to play and they lost the game. Yeah. So, you know, on Utica's getting there. And, and so we look at Wednesday as a trap, but I also look at Sunday as a little bit of a trap because it would be very easy, especially if the soccer's win tomorrow and then they win on Friday to be like, oh, and then the last place team is coming in that's two and seven or whatever. We're going to romp on those guys. No, Utica City's getting better. They're getting incrementally better. They, we talked about it before they added Everton Marrera, who used to be the head coach of St. Louis. He's 42, but he's extremely knowledgeable. He, he, you are literally adding a coach to the field. So I think the Utica match is going to be a close match. And I think it's going to be a tough match. It's going to be a really good match, but like you said, we can't get comfortable. We can't uh, get complacent and just assume that the numbers speak for what Utica looks like now because it's not at all uh, the case. So uh, that's going to be a good, uh, another good match. I think as long as uh, the soccer uh, are aware of, you know, the fact that they cannot get comfortable with Utica because Utica will take advantage. And that one, 
like you said, it actually does feel a little bit more like a trap game. I would say thinking about it a little bit more uh, feels like more of a trap game than maybe the Ontario game. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if we win tomorrow, we win on Friday. We have to have to show up the same way we did the last two days on Sunday. That's it. You got to keep the intensity. Uh, last standings check is the Central Kansas City. Uh, huge, huge performance last week. You know, the the coaches convention in Kansas City, having the MASL represented at that coaches convention. That was big. Having the game at the T-Mobile Center downtown uh, in downtown Kansas City was huge. Kansas City responded with an absolute thumping of the Tacoma Stars, uh, drubbed them. And the Comets are now eight and one. 24 points plus 29 goal differential. And then you look St. Louis five and five, but a negative goal differential Dallas five and six negative 22 goal differential and Milwaukee two, five and one seven points, you know, and, and they're in the bottom right now. But when you switch it from division to wild card and you look at that top eight teams make the playoffs right now, Milwaukee by one point is in the eighth playoff spot the four out of uh, position teams are Tacoma, Utica, Harrisburg, and Chihuahua. I am here to say that I believe Chihuahua will push one more team out of the playoff bracket and into the out of playoff bracket uh, by the end of the year. But who will that be? Will it be Baltimore? Will it be Dallas? Will it be St. Louis? You know, it, it's hard to say. It won't be Ontario. Ontario is going to make the playoffs. Uh, you know, and I think Milwaukee's probably going to make the playoffs too, uh, despite starting the year 0 and 5. But uh, it, it's going to be really interesting at the bottom of those rankings to see how things shake out. It's great to see the level two of play in MASL be where it is right now, where it is very competitive. And again, level, I think is the word it's, you don't, you just don't know because these teams now, uh, as we progress in the season, you're starting to see a lot of games closer and closer and closer to the really pushing and going into overtime, you know, and I, I love to see that. That's what you want in a league because it makes that much more exciting. These next three games are going to be uh, very important for the soccers, I think. Uh, and also going to be very interesting to see the other games that are happening around the league too. Uh, so we'll see. It's going to be an exciting week for sure. A very busy week. I need a break, Greg. <laughs> yeah, <very. laughs> you, and me, you and me both, brother. You and me both. But are you so going to Ontario tomorrow? Man. I know. I'm, I'm oh. driving. I'm driving a lot. I'm driving a lot. So uh, let's just lay it out. The week to come tomorrow, Wednesday, January 26th. Uh, you know, we're recording this on Tuesday night. If you're listening on Wednesday morning, today, uh, 7 p.m on a Toyota arena, watch the match on MASL TV, unless you're making the trip up with us up the I-15. Uh, we'll see at Toyota arena. If that's the case, the soccer's and the fury Friday, 7 35 PM, the Tacoma stars at Pachanga arena, San Diego, star Wars night, Mandalorian kits, $2 Bud Light Friday night, game one Jersey auction to benefit San Diego food bank. The 501st Legion out on the concourse, on the field, in the penalty boxes, on the touchline for the opening kickoffs. All of these things are for the uh, for the player introductions. All these things are going to be happening. It's going to be one of the most fun nights of the year. Don't miss it. The big Omicron wave. It's starting to crest downward, folks. It's coming down. It's coming down. It's safer tomorrow than it was today. It's safer the next day than it was tomorrow. Every day it's getting safer. Come out. Bring your family. You know, mask mandate still in place. Bring that mask. You're comfortable. You're good. You know how to do it. We'll see you there on Friday. And then Sunday, 5 p.m., first responders night, water bottle giveaway. For those who take part in the double deal, we are giving you a seat to Sunday's match and a $10 coupon to the merch stand to make sure you come out and enjoy the first ever meeting between the Soccers and Utica City FC. All of this happening between now and and our next episode. When we come back, this team will have played 10 games, Jerry. We'll, we'll be 10 out of 24 into the season. My goodness. 40%? We'll be 40% of the way through the season. Time flies by when you're having fun. Look at that. We're also in episode 12 today? 11. Yep. No, 12. Yeah, 12. Oh, jeez. Wow. Now, thank you guys, everybody that's listening for uh, continuing to do so, for following along. Hopefully you guys enjoy this as much as we love 
putting it out there for you guys. Um, again, any suggestions, things like that, make sure you, you hit us up. But this weekend is going to be a fun one. We hope to see you all out there. Uh, if you see me out running around in the stands, please don't hesitate to call my name and say hi. Uh, call me by whatever name. I'll probably turn around. Uh, and uh, Grogu, Yoda, Jerry, whatever you want to call me, I'm the little, I'm the little guy running around the the entire arena all day. So that'll be me. <laughs> so much fun. Well, hey, we've hit the 90 minute mark. We have reached the end of this week's episode of Soccer's Overtime. As always, I thank Jerry Jimenez for being our producer as well as our co-host uh, and having everything happen here. We thank all of you for joining us live on Twitch. This is our biggest soccer's overtime audience that we've had uh, in terms of people watching on twitch so we thank you uh, and we appreciate all of your support last weekend and this week as well we'll see you on social media we'll see you on masl tv on friday and sunday hopefully we'll see you at pachanga arena san diego friday and sunday night for these two incredible matches but until then for our special guest felipe gonzalez and for Jerry Jimenez, I'm Craig Elston. Bobby Cressy writes our theme song, Beyond the South Bay, available on the Cali Native record, which you can find on iTunes or wherever you get your tunes. And I'm Craig Elston saying thanks so much for tuning into Soccer's Overtime. We'll see you for three matches this week. Have a great rest of your night and go Soccer's! <laughs>